a lot longer than your dad's fight. Yeah. Took it back. It took ten seconds. Is what Sounds it took. good. But just for safety, can you count to ten? Ten. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Ten, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three. Is it possible to turn this meter off? No. I can see. I can hear it. That's governed by. It's governed by Jamie. No. Oh. Everything works. The bike's better. We'll have to talk over it. You're louder than. I'll talk as loud as you want. You might be able to like, <coughs> the taxes that well, are reported in traffic. Well, they're like this. Yeah, I'll, I'll, give you, I'll give you one chance. So, you have, you have an idea on how to work on this thing? Uh, you turn down the okay. fan? Yeah. It's the fan that's making the noise. No, but I turned it down. I turned, that's, it, we only have one option here. To oh. turn. Uh, we don't control that. Americans added us. Okay. The building. Or I can just, mm, yeah, can I can match it. It'll be all right. It's not terrible. You're louder than this. But, uh, I'll just speak louder. Okay. All right, we'll when my on. wife walks in, I'll start yelling. So it's perfect. No yelling. No yelling. Okay, Jamie. We're ready. Vegas. It's February 5th, 2019. Uh, we're going to be talking, Brian is going to be talking about his father, Hank. Uh, thank you very much. Well, you're welcome. My favorite subject. Excellent. Uh, why don't we start, I like to usually start the interviews to try and see how far we can go back and uh, talk about your, your father, your grandparents potentially, where they were from, kind of get a background where your father where your father came from? Well, I can't go back before 1946, no matter how hard I try. So I will try to fill it in with stories I've heard, right? Yes. Uh, my grandparents, my father's uh, father and mother were from, you know, Russian-dominated Poland. Um, they married as teenagers and moved to uh, my, they moved to uh, Massachusetts, I believe early on, where my grandfather's father, my great-grandfather, uh, was a cantor, I believe. Then, then my gr grandparents moved down to Brooklyn, where my grandfather followed his dream, <laughs> which was to study the Talmud. When I knew him, when he moved to Las Vegas, uh, I, I remember him. He was a diminutive man uh, who was always praying. If you wanted to talk to him, you had to get in behind him and walk around as he was davening, right? Um, all I ever knew him was a man who was praying very quiet. My grandmother, on the other hand, basically ran the family and she made the living because what my grandfather did for a living most of the time was art, picture, and framing shops. Um, and most of the time he didn't sell them, he gave them to people who admired them. And so it was a losing proposition, which is probably where I got my talent. But uh, the combination of the two, my grandmother making a living for the family, my grandfather providing the, the moral certainty, let's say, that came from the Talmud, provided the home in which my father grew up in. And, uh, of course, he... He grew up in Brooklyn, and then the family moved to Connecticut during his young years. When was your father born? Uh, August 27th, 1909. 
So in, you know, when he was just a few years old, the family moved to Connecticut uh, during World War I, where my grandfather, which was way out of character, went to work for, the, for a, uh, a gun manufacturing company making ammunition for the war. Um, so opposite of what, what he was. In any event, after, after the war, my parents, my grandparents moved back to Brooklyn, uh, where my father basically spent his early and uh, later teen, teen years. Um, so that's where he grew up. And he grew up uh, basically working all his young and early life uh, to support the family, as most people did in that generation at that time. So my mother, uh, my mother's family, uh, my mother grew up in Ireland, in Dublin. My grandfather, Joseph Ritchie, um, was the Paramount Film Distributor for Ireland. Rather big job in those days. He was also an inveterate uh, horse player. So the money came in one hand and went out the other. That was, that was their life. Uh, during the war, during World War II, they moved to uh, Belfast. It wasn't safe for Jews in Dublin, uh, so they moved up to Belfast. And that's where my parents met in 1944. Let's, let's get to the okay. uh, story in a, in a minute. Your father's family growing up, were they, was it a traditional home? Uh, well, it was traditional from the sense that my grandfather provided all the spiritual guidance. My grandmother added a strong dose of reality. Uh, he wasn't particularly religious, although he was imbued with it. It was osmotic for him. Uh, but his grandfather, who was the cantor, I remember the way my dad explained it. When you walked into their home, there was a huge picture of Theodore Herzl. And that was their home. It was a Zionist home. And so his whole life, all he knew about was Zionism. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? About how you know, the Zionism or things like that might have, uh, like what he heard about? Well, of course, this was long before World War II came, came along. So in his young years, um, you know, the, the whole Zionist ideal was a homeland for the Jews who had been persecuted for, you know, a few billion years or whatever, you know thousand years and the idea that they would have a homeland for Jews so that he grew up with that I don't know that it was anything deeper than that he just knew that that was the right thing to do at some point in your life if you ever have an opportunity he never acted on it in his early years he wasn't a you know a, a, an activist Zionist if you will I think World War II changed him or at least created the opportunity for those for the understanding he had as a young man to turn into feelings as a grown-up and then action shortly thereafter. So it, took, it was a continuum for him. They have, uh, you know, if they had a, a blue box, like, uh, like, like the JNF kind of... Uh... I, I don't know. I just, I don't know that. Um, he certainly had one in his head. What language did they speak? Did they speak uh, Yiddish? Yiddish? Yeah, well, his parents yelled at him in Yiddish, from what I understand. He, sir, he was fluent in Yiddish. Um, but it was also a very American home. You know, he was born in the United States. His sisters were, most of them were born in the United States. And uh, what so... What place was he in the family? What number was he? He was number three. Wait. Yes, he was number three. Two older sisters, Millie, then Alice, then my father, and then a few years later, four years later, my Uncle Dave. Dave was the youngest, so two girls and two boys. But even as the third oldest, or third youngest, he was always the oldest in the family because he was the first male in those days. And he's the one everyone looked to for, for work. He's the one everyone looked to for, um, you know, let's say generational guidance. He was, it was always Hank. Was, I think it was Heimela then, or Herman. Uh, that's the one, he's the one they turned to. So from a very early age, he was providing. Uh, you know what kind of jobs he held when he was, uh, when he was younger? He was, uh, the traditional jobs of any young boy in America. He was a 
He delivered newspapers. And then he went to work um, for a milkman, delivering milk. These are when he was like eight, nine, ten years old. When he moved back to New York, uh, through a series of circumstances, he got a job as a runner. And this, is, this I think, was a, a, a part of his life that helped shape him for the latter part of his life when he moved to Las Vegas. He, he got a job as a runner at a theater ticket agency in New York on Broadway called LeBlanc Grays. And basically, he, he ran from theater to theater picking up tickets right before showtime that LeBlanc, LeBlanc Gray would sell uh, half price to people who wanted half price tickets. And as I remember the way he used to tell the stories, uh, that LeBlanc Gray's was responsible in large part for some huge Broadway hits. Broadway plays that were otherwise going down the tubes but for the fact that they made all these half-price tickets available, people thronged to the, they went in droves to the theaters and made it a success. They gave it the time and space these shows need um, to last more than a week or whatever. And um, so LeBlanc Grays was a big part of his life, and that's where he met all the colorful characters on Broadway, and he loved it. So later, years later, when he moved out to Las Vegas, Nevada, I think it was the same characters, maybe the next generation of them. So now, you, but you, the point is, that was a job that uh, he had most of his high school years, his college years, and even into law school uh, until he started interning at, at a law firm. Where did he go to college? He went to college, uh, uh, St. John's in Brooklyn, and St. John's Law School. Well, every young Jewish boy does what his mother wants. Right. And his mother wanted him to be a lawyer, just like my mother wanted me to be a lawyer. Um, so you do what your mother tells you. Did he want to be a lawyer? Um, I, think, I think early on he wanted to be a writer and he wanted to live that colorful life. Uh, law was pretty boring to him. But throughout his life, you know, law, law brought him to Las Vegas so law was the reason that everything happened. So did he want it? I, I don't know if he really wanted it. To, how do you ever want to be a lawyer, um, especially after you've been a lawyer? Um, well, that's not true. He, he wanted more action, and law was not, the, he was not going to get it from the law. Plus, he had this keen sense of right and wrong um, that made it very difficult certainly to be a criminal lawyer, and that was the part of the law that he was involved in. Um, it was hard defending people who were, that he knew were guilty, and he'd rather put in jail himself, but he wound up defending them. It was hard for him to square those two things. Is there family still in Europe uh, in, the, in the 30s and, and not, not that I know of. I have never heard any of those awful, awful stories from anyone in my family who would recount that they lost a cousin or a, an aunt or an uncle or someone like that. So as far as I know, they all had gotten out of there in the, you know, the, the huge immigration wave of the early 1900s, late 1800s. That's, and <clears throat> so then where, do you know, uh, do you ever talk about when they first started to hear about what was going on in Europe? Or maybe uh, if that, you know, impacted him or news or... You know, in most of the stories I heard from my father, um, if, if you're trying to find out when, when he knew what Hitler was doing, uh, I didn't hear those kind of stories from him. I heard per purely American stories, if you will, and by that I mean what drove him into the service, besides the induction notice, what drove him into the service was the attack on Pearl Harbor, the appropriate response to the attack on Pearl Harbor. What drove him, uh, he, he was in before that, he was inducted prior to that, then he was sent home on leave or something, then the Japanese attacked, and boom, he was back the next day. 
but it was a re it was a, the American response to the attack by the Japanese. It wasn't this burning desire to go to Ger to Germany and free the Jews because I don't think that was at top of his mind, which leads me to believe that he didn't know about it. Because had he known about it, he'd have been over there with or without the army. You know, that's just who he was. Where he got it, where he where he got that that drive that, that stayed inside of him was when he went to France after D-Day, or on D-Day and then after, um, and went to the small towns in France as, he, as a, his company moved through it um, that were once inhabited by Jews and heard the stories of what had happened. And that's where, you know, as he explained it, it was seared into his memory forever. So I'm not so sure to answer your question that he was uh, any different than most Americans, especially the ones fighting the war. They didn't see it or hear it or come upon it until they came upon it. It just wasn't, uh, it, what, nothing went through his family, nothing went through his consciousness uh, that said, oh my God, Hitler's killing Jews over there. Now, maybe he was too busy preparing to go over there to fight. I, I don't know. So he enlists then after Pearl Harbor. He was first inducted before Pearl Harbor. Goes through basic training, does all that stuff. I think they sent him to the Pentagon for a while, hated that. And then they sent him home. He was home. already finished law school. Yes. Okay. Then they sent him home or they put him on leave for a while. In just a short period of time, then Pearl Harbor happens. And so the next day he's reporting back in. And from then on, he, he was, I think, a private. Uh, and then he went on to become a captain. Uh, he had a bunch of battlefield commissions, sergeant and then lieutenant and then first lieutenant, captain. And I think when he got out, he was a major. Um, he rose up pretty, as a lot of people did, uh, he rose up pretty fast during the war. And he goes uh, to Europe. Yes. He's, uh, he, is, he's seen real, uh, real action there. Uh, oh sure. Oh, you know he, he was in the thick of it. Um, in fact, he always used to tell us as kids, when you hear a noise over here, run the other way. Don't run toward it. And yet he did just the opposite in the war. Uh, when he would see, there was one story he saw. You know, all these American troops coming back toward him as he was moving his company forward. And they were come, leaving almost in a panic. Retreat, retreat, retreat. The Germans are coming, whatever it was. And he said, no, uh, we're going this way. And he turned them around and went that way and won the day, whatever it was. He, he just had an instinct for knowing where the trouble was and going to it. And, of course, based on that, he tried to get his kids to grow up going away from the trouble. Um, because he'd, he'd been through it, and he knew that when you meet the trouble head-on, it's not a pleasant picture. And he, no parent wants that for their kids. Uh, he never taught us. He, he never taught us to run. He just taught us not to run toward trouble, unless you know, if we were in it, then we were taught how to deal with it. But not to run toward it voluntarily. Uh, and yet, he always ran toward it voluntarily. That's just who he was. When, when did he meet your mother? He met my mother uh, in early 1944. He was stationed in Belfast with his men, preparing to go over on D-Day. And um, I guess it was a custom. When there was a Jewish wedding, there weren't too many of them, as you might imagine, in Ireland, but there were some, that they invited the Jewish officers who were stationed. So he was invited to the wedding. And uh, when he got to the wedding, he saw my mother walk in with friends. And he asked the people he was with, who is that girl over there? And uh, they said her name is Barbara Ritchie. He said, is she married, engaged, dating? And he said, no. He said, it gives me an idea. Introduce me after the wedding. So after the wedding, his friends introduce him. This is Barbara Ritchie. And I think before she ever got his name, he said, I'm going to give you 24 hours to decide whether you're going to marry me. 
And she looked at him and basically, I think she said, what's your name, Captain? She just thought he was some rude American, you know. I guess they were used to that. Uh, and he introduced himself. And she, I think she said, you're better off with a number than that name, you know, Herman Milton Greenspun. Uh, you're better off with a number, and walked away. And, of course, he pursued her. And within a week or so, she said, yes, I will marry you. So she, as she told the story later on, she decided right then and there when she met him that she was going to marry him. She played a little hard to get, I guess. And uh, they were married a few months later in Belfast, uh, just before he went over um, to France. So they're married already, and now he's going into... Uh, into war. Into war, uh-huh. Yeah. And your mother stays... In She's in... She, she, well, she, was, she stayed in Ireland for a short period of time, and then went to work for Schaefe, uh, Supreme Headquarters, the Allied Expeditionary Force in London. She figured she was going to do her part, right? And uh, an interesting story, I, I, I keep blanking on the name. It's not Harrods. There were two major department stores in uh, London, still are. I can't remember the name. But during the war, so she was working in the basement of this one department store. And um, word came back that my father was, had been brought back from France to a hospital outside of London. He had frostbite and they were going to they were bring him back to amputate his feet. And uh, she heard that he was coming back. So she and her cousin, who was also working there, uh, decided to play hooky and go visit my father outside of London. And on that day, the Germans bombed that department store. People were killed. She wasn't because she was at the hospital convincing the doctors to save his feet, which they did. And, and that, in part... That little episode, in part, led to his coming out to Las Vegas to live or to stay because he didn't want to be cold again. And he was living back east. It was freezing all the time. He wound up in Las Vegas one day, and it was warm. He said, yeah, this is a good place. I'm going to live here. Uh, and that, that's a great story. But um, anyway, he married, he married my mother just before he went over on D-Day. Um, comes back to the hospital, he gets out after that because they're not going to put him back in. And um, they come to the United States right after, the, you know, right after he's sent back home. Uh, he went, before, uh, before we get back to the States, he's, uh, he has the chance meeting when he's, uh, when he's out in the field with uh, General Eisenhower? Well, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's interesting. I, he's got a picture of himself with General Eisenhower inspecting this bombed-out truck. My dad was a captain, a, a, a company commander of an ordnance uh, company, and um, they met heavy fire, and their trucks were blown up, and, you know, it was, it was a mess. And apparently the general was inspecting the troops and inspecting the damage, and he's standing there looking at a truck with my father, when apparently the general's photographer snaps a picture. That's still 1944. Fast forward in Las Vegas, six, eight, ten years later, my dad has a newspaper, and a lot of the people in Las Vegas didn't like him, and they were calling him a communist and everything else. Somehow he got a copy of that picture, and he trots the picture out and runs it on the front page of his picture. If I'm a communist, I'm in good company. Look what I did in the war type of, you know, look who I'm here with. And it blunted the criticism because, you know, shortly after, no one was going to attack war heroes. And certainly no one was going to attack General Eisenhower, who was then president of the United States. So it was just one of those fortuitous occasions out in the middle of a battlefield where someone had the presence to take a picture and somehow get a copy of it to my father. You know, he was lucky that way. Uh, was your father a good soldier? My father was a great soldier. He was a great soldier. I, I didn't hear a lot of his exploits. He didn't talk about a lot of his exploits. They were mostly in terms of stories on how, how we as kids should conduct ourselves. And uh, it was always, always take care of your men first. 
Uh, they're, the, they're the most important, which you know carries throughout life. You always take care of your people first, whatever it happens to be. Um, I know he, in, in a book he wrote, uh, he did tell that story about the, the retreating Americans that he turned around. Uh, he did win. Uh, he was awarded the Croix de Guerre uh, from General de Gaulle. He was awarded uh, numerous uh, awards for bravery by, by the United States Army. Uh, not much, not very different from a whole lot of people, obviously, in that war, in that generation. But um, he never put up his war record against anyone else. But I think objectively, if you had to do that, he'd come out pretty close to the top. No Audi Murphy, but, you know, close to the top. Was he, um, how was he with uh, authority and the Army? Uh... <laughs> he always had trouble with authority. Um, he played chess when most people were playing checkers, and in the Army they play a lot of checkers. And uh, I don't think, well, there was, there's one, well-known story, relatively well-known story about a time he disobeyed direct orders. Um, he made his own judgment <clears throat> that he should disobey him. Uh, it was when, when he came back uh, to that hospital in London and um, he was in the hospital on crutches and um, The commander of the oh thank you the com thanks Eric. the commander uh, one sorry the, <clears throat> the commander of the hospital ward had canceled all the leave for the enlisted men and officers they were in the hospital there was nothing they weren't going back into the war and it might have been New Year's Eve or whatever. And uh, my dad made a command decision that that's baloney. And when the commander of the hospital went home, he, he, he left. And I think some of the other men left, too. And he went out to see my mother, because he hadn't seen her since before, the, before he went over uh, D-Day, months, months earlier. And he spent, um, I think he spent the night with her, a couple nights with her in a farmhouse outside of London. For New Year's. And of course, nine months later, my sister was born. So it was a very productive New Year's. Um, but for that, this colonel at the, airport, at the uh, ar Army base, the hospital, um, put my dad in for a court martial for violating orders. And um, so my dad was put on trial. He was given a reprimand or something. I don't remember what it was. Um, but he took it gladly. So if you ask if he, how, how he did with, with orders, with appropriate orders, he was fine. And he gave many orders and expected his men to obey them. But that was sometimes, I guess you learn from that, sometimes people who are a bit too officious and aren't thinking clearly give stupid orders, and you have some moral obligation to challenge them, let's say. Especially if you're amongst a bunch of injured men who have nowhere to go, they're not going back into the war. And it's New Year's. At least that's the way I took it. So now they, he gets discharged, honorable discharge from uh, from the service. Yep. And and then they make their way. Back they to get the back. State. They go back to New York. They're living with my grandparents after he gets mustered out, um, and he's working as a lawyer now. And uh, some guy comes to the law firm who wants to build a racetrack, a guy named Joe Smoot, wants to build a racetrack in a place called Las Vegas, Nevada. Now, this is 1946. There aren't 15,000 people in the entire southern Nevada area where Las Vegas is. And this guy wants to build a racetrack in the middle of the desert. So they tap my father, who's a, now he's a, not a young associate, he, he's older, but he has a car, which was the important part. said, you go drive out to Las Vegas with this guy and help him build his racetrack. So my dad drives out in the fall of 46, October-ish, and you can imagine what the weather 
was like uh, in 1946 in October coming across from east to west. Uh, imagine the worst kind of weather. That's what he drove through. And he shows up in Las Vegas that day, checks into what was then the El Rancho Hotel. Checks into, he, he drives out to Las Vegas, checks into the El Rancho Hotel, and they had a swimming pool. And he goes swimming. It's 78 degrees, I remember he told the story. Gets out of the pool. It's the first time I think he's been warm since he got trench foot. Calls my mother, who's in New York, with my older sister and pregnant with me, and says, get on a train and come out to Las Vegas because I'm never coming back. That was the first night. He was always impulsive. And, of course, she did. And then I guess he looked around and said, okay, what am I going to do now? Because the guy with the racetrack a few weeks later decided it was a bust, wasn't going to happen. So he decided to study for the bar and become a lawyer out here in Las Vegas. <clears throat> While he's studying for the bar, he has to do something to make a living. So he gets involved with some friends he, he got to know. They were going to start a radio station. And the governor of the state of Nevada was going to come down to Las Vegas, little tiny Las Vegas. In those days, Las Vegas was nothing. And he was going to be there for the festivities of the opening of this racetrack. And that's when the whole thing the whole started. I mean, excuse me, opening of the radio station. What's in Las Vegas at this time? How, what, 15,000 people. Are there, is, Not, is, there's is, some, a few gambling joints, tiny ones. Uh, gambling had been legal in Nevada for, since I think 1932 or 33. But there was nothing here to speak of. It was a little cowboy town. It was a, a watering hole for the train that went from Salt Lake to Los Angeles. There was nothing here. Uh, and a lot of desert. But it was warm. You know, coming into winter. And that's where he said he's going to live. Um, so he gets involved with some people to open a radio station. The governor is coming down from Reno, from Carson City, Nevada, to help him open the radio station. My mother has a job at the uh, place called Fanny's Dress, Dress Shop. She was a model. My dad was going to pick her up take her to the opening of this radio station and that's when he got the knock on the door and that's where all this stuff happened so what happened when, when is this this is 1940 this is now a, a year later 1947 the flamingo hotel has been open for a few months that's where the dress store is that my mother's working my dad's supposed to pick her up to go to the opening and as i said knock on the door. My dad opens the door. He's at home getting dressed. And it's a fellow by the name of Al Schwimmer and Reynolds Selk. Reynolds is my dad's cousin. My dad had no idea who Al Schwimmer was. He invites him in, of course. He says, I don't have much time. What's on your mind? What are you doing here? And that's when they tell him the story, the story of Israel. Al tells him, first of all, he swears him to secrecy. He tells him that there's a guy in New York here on behalf of David Ben-Gurion who sent him to raise money and find weapons and airplanes, whatever they can find, to send to Israel. Because Israel is going to, the partition is coming in 48, and they need to get all these weapons and airplanes. They have to defend themselves because the Arab countries surrounding Israel have already said they're going to run them into the sea. They're going to annihilate them. So they have to find a way to arm the Jewish settlers in, in, in what was in Palestine um, so they can defend themselves. And Al Schwimmer and Reynolds Selk, no airplanes. They were flyers in World War II. They don't know anything about ordnance. They don't know weapons. They don't know ammo. They don't know any of that stuff. But Reynolds had told Al Schwimmer that he has a cousin in Las Vegas who knows it, because that's what he did in the war, and that's why they're standing in my dad's house, and they need his help. My dad, the way he told the story, remembered that 
after D-Day when they're working their way through France, they go to this little village called Nancy, N-A-N-C-Y, Nancy, where there were 5,000 Jews who once lived there, and now there were a handful. All the rest had either run or been killed. And he swore to himself, if I can ever do anything to fulfill my grandfather's dream of Zionism, a place, a homeland for the Jews, then I will do my part. So he said, of course, right away, he said, of course, I'll help. I can be ready in about two weeks. They said, oh, no, 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 this isn't, you don't have time to get ready in two weeks. You've got to go tonight. And he says, but I've got to go pick my wife up. We're, you know, the governor's coming. We're opening this thing. I, I can be ready tomorrow. No, 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 you're leaving tonight. Well, I've got to go tell my wife. She's going to worry. No, no, we'll take care of that. Well, I don't have any clothes packed. I, we'll get clothes in Hawaii. You're going to Hawaii tonight. Why am I going to Hawaii? Because there's a nice Jewish man who has an a armed uh, war surplus depot with lots of airplane parts, whatever. You're going to go down there and get all that stuff and ship it up to Los Angeles so we can get on with this. Well, I don't have a ticket. Here's your ticket. They basically had the whole thing planned. They were not going to take no for an answer. And Reynolds knew my dad was not going to say no. So he got on the airplane that night. And as my mother tells the story, she got tired of waiting for him to pick her up. So she went home. She had no idea. He called her the next day, said that he had gone to Hawaii to start an airline. And he'll be back in a couple of days. And of course, because he couldn't tell her what was going on. It was, they were violating every rule known to man and half the laws of the United States. So he gets to Hawaii, and that's where his uh, excitement started. Nathan Liff was the man who had the war surplus yard. When my dad told him what he was doing, Nathan said, take whatever you want. Just take it. So my dad looked around, saw lots of airplane engines and spare parts, things like that. And he looked just beyond the yard. There was a huge fence, cyclone fence, and two Navy Marine guards, I mean Marine guards, guarding it. He said, I wonder what's there. So that night, they cut a, a hole in the fence, he and a couple friends, and they went through into what was a Navy depot full of brand, they opened the crates full of brand new machine guns and ammunition, whatever, whatever you need to defend yourself in a war for sure and he figured that Israel needed that more than they needed airplane engines so f instead of staying for two days he stayed for two or three weeks and every night when the marine guards would head off in a different direction they would go through the fence with forklifts and they stole tons and tons and tons of machine guns all kinds of weapons all kinds of ammunition brought it into Nathan Lift's yard moved them into crates marked aircraft engines, and then shipped them back to Los Angeles because he knew though that's what had to get to Israel. And, um, you know, they come back to Los Angeles, and, of course, they know they're violating the law, and they know that the feds are hot on their trail, the FBI. But they're always trying to stay a day or an hour, or two weeks or whatever it is ahead of them. And they get word one night that the FBI is, is honing in on them. And they're going to come confiscate all the weapons and arrest them the next morning. So my dad makes arrangement with this fellow who has a boat. They're going to load all these weapons on his boat, and they're going to take them to Mexico. He tells the guy they're going to take it out to Catalina and move it on to another boat, and that boat will leave. So he makes his deal with this guy who owns the boat. They load the boat up all night, all these volunteers, and by early morning, the portholes are underwater because it's so heavy. The guy says, I'm not, you're not taking my boat, you're going to sink it. It's too heavy. So my dad made a command decision that he made a lot, I think, during the war. He pulled out his gun, stuck it to his head, and said, you got five seconds to change your mind or I'm going to lighten the load by sending you overboard. Not in very good shape. So Lee Lewis, the captain, said, uh, okay, I'll go. He, he made a smart move. He didn't want to die. And they took the boat. But instead of going to Catalina, they took it all the way to Mexico. And they offloaded the weapons, 
And now my dad had to get the weapons from the west side of Mexico to the east side, to Tampico Bay, so they could sail them out to cross the ocean. And he also realized, then he was called to New York by Teddy Kollek, who was running the operation, who then became, ultimately became mayor of Jerusalem, Mr. Mayor, and uh, who informed my dad they need a lot more than what he had. So my dad went all over Central and South America, every dictator in every South American country making all kinds of deals to buy weapons. A lot of times they were 30, 40 year old weapons, but to buy weapons. And he moved it all to Mexico. This is, a, it, I'm, I'm condensing it, it's, it takes a good while for all this to happen. He had, a, he had reached an understanding with the president of Mexico and his army general um, to allow them to move all these weapons to Tampico Bay. Um, in those days, it was easy to make such arrangements. And um, when he had all these weapons and he was preparing to put them on a train, there was a story in the newspaper in Mexico City that talked about this agent for Israel amassing weapons to ship to Israel in violation of the Neutrality Act of the United States, and, Israel, and Mexico shouldn't play a part in that. There was a large Arab population in Mexico City that had heard about this and you know, started agitating against it. So my father was called into President Aleman's office with his generals and was told that, um, I guess it's just too much political heat, they can't allow him to move the weapons from one side of Mexico to the other, and they have to end their operations. So at that point, my dad had to improvise. And he said, wait a minute. You believe this story? He says, what do you mean? He said, I'm not here on behalf of Israel. That's my cover story. I am here on behalf of Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek who's in Formosa on Taiwan. We need these weapons to go fight the communists on mainland China, Chiang Kai I mean uh, Mao Zedong. I'm here on behalf of General Chiang Kai-shek, but I can't tell anybody. And so the general says, you can prove that? My dad says, I'll have my orders for you this afternoon. He says, great, that's all we need. So my dad and his friend Willie Saz now, who was helping him, they leave the president's office and they're walking down Chapultepec Street, park, and what are they going to do? They have a clue. They look up, right across the street, big emblem, Embassy of China. So my dad says, let's go over and see what's going on. So it's a Sunday, and the embassy's closed, but there's a young man inside. So the way my dad told the story, he said they knock on the door, and the little the Chinese guy comes over, we're closed, and my dad says, yeah, but we're going to China, and we need some maps and some information, and we're leaving right away, can you help us? So the guy opens the door. My dad says in Yiddish to, uh, to Willie, go walk the guy around, let me see what's going on over here. So the guy takes him off to look at maps and books and whatever. My dad goes to all these desks that are there, and he sees all the stationery in Chinese. He had a trench coat. He sticks all the stuff in his trench coat. He finds a, a stamp. You know, the, in those days, they had these official stamps. He put one of those in his. He took everything off the desk he could take, motions to Willie, and they leave. Now what are they going to do? They're walking a little further. There's a Chinese restaurant. Always on Sunday, there's a Chinese restaurant for Jews, right? They go in. They take the menu, and they go back to their room, and on the Chinese stationery, they're writing in Chinese, you know, Mugu Pan, whatever it is, off the menu. And then they translate it into Spanish. Dear President Al Alaman, this will introduce Colonel Herman Greenspun, who is here on my behalf. Anything you can do will be appreciated. Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, whatever, in Spanish. And they show up at 5 o'clock with these orders. They say, looks good to us, stamp, stamp, here's your permit, get the train to Tampico Bay, and you're good to go. Of course, the next day, they get a hold of my dad and said, you know, we, we can't accept all that, but we're going to give you 24 hours to get out of Dodge. <laughs>
So he gets over to Tampico Bay, goes to the ship's captain who decides he's not going to sail this stuff. He's not taking it out. My dad has the same gun in the same pocket, does the same routine that he did with Lee Lewis. Amid the, amidst the protests of the captain's wife, threatening my dad that he doesn't have the courage to go through with it, my dad says, well, you know, you take the risk, the loss will be yours. The ship captain makes the right decision to sail, and the boat sails. And it goes to Haifa. So now, I didn't know this part of the story until much, much later, probably mid-2000s, 2008, 2009, somewhere in there. We were interviewing uh, Shimon Peres for a documentary we did. And Shimon talks about how he was there in Haifa, waiting for that ship like they were waiting for the Messiah. Because the weapons from that ship went to break the siege of Jerusalem and then take the Negev. Now, one of my favorite movies of all time was Cast a Giant Shadow about Colonel Mickey Marcus. And that whole story is about how he was training the Israelis for war. They had to build a road to Haifa. They had to get these weapons from a ship and they broke the siege of Jerusalem and the whole story came together. And I didn't know that my whole life. But if you listen to Shimon and you take, cast a giant shadow, it's very clear to me that the boat that so, sailed, the Kafalos, that sailed from Tampico Bay to Haifa provided the wherewithal for the Israelis to break the siege of Jerusalem and take the Negev and win the war. Wow. Yeah, wow. It is a wow. It's a wow. Where, where's your mother in this story? She's in Las Vegas wondering where her husband went. <laughs> I mean, seriously, she now has two kids. Yeah. And uh, he couldn't tell her. He didn't tell her. He, you know, I, I'm sure he lied to her about what he was doing. And um, ultimately, I'm sure he came clean. Uh, but by that time, all the trouble was over, and he was just facing the aftermath of what they had done. Because, you know, 1948 came and went. I think in 1949, my dad and Schwimmer and others were indicted by the federal government for violating all kinds of laws. The first trial, uh, Schwimmer was convicted. My dad was not because that was about airplanes. My dad had nothing to do with the airplanes. Then he was my dad was indicted for violating the Neutrality Act uh, for the weapons. And he was called again to New York, and he was told that he would have to plead guilty. Why? Because all the donors that Kalik had put together, all the flyers who had gone to volunteer to go over there, all the volunteers were going to be indicted by the federal government, by the U.S. government unless my dad took a plea. That was the deal they made. If my dad pled guilty, everybody else would go free. No one, nothing else would happen. So my dad obviously pled guilty. And um, he's, he has to go to Los Angeles now in front of the federal judge to be sentenced. It was, I think, up to five years in prison. And um, my mother went with him. And you know, they were all expecting the worst, of course. And the judge, Pearson Hall, had my dad stand up and said, Mr. Greenspun, you've pled guilty. This is a terrible, terrible crime against the United States. And you were the leader. It all came down on you. But knowing the reasons which compelled you to do this, I cannot send you to prison. So he gave him a fine. My dad was a convicted felon at that point, but he was free. And um, so after that, you had Al Schwimmer, a convicted felon, and Hank Greenspun, a convicted felon. It was a badge of courage, of course. And they went on about their lives. It's a heck of a way to start your young life in, in Las Vegas. Of course, as you know, in the Talmud, it says if, uh, if you save a life, it's like saving the world, and you're responsible for that life the rest of your life. So if Hank was one of those people who helped save Israel, 
he certainly was responsible for it the rest of his life, and he acted that way. Um, now, he was ultimately pardoned by President Kennedy in 1961. Well, I, I guess it came about because my dad and his newspaper supported Richard Nixon against, <laughs> against Jack Kennedy. Uh, but my dad knew Senator Kennedy uh, for a few years. And so when our senior senator, Alan Bible, went to President Kennedy, then President Kennedy to give a pardon to my father, Kennedy knew the righteousness of the act, and he gave him a pardon. Uh, so Senator Bible is the one who went to uh, Kennedy. Um, and so he pardoned him in 1961. Al Schwimmer didn't get pardoned until the year 2000 by President Clinton. Why is that? The way Al told the story, he always thought that if he, a if he asked for a pardon, he had to admit that what he did was wrong. And Al never believed what he did was wrong and never would admit, therefore, that it was wrong. Of course, he was wrong. You didn't have to do that. He just never got around to it. It was not important to him, so he said, you know, he was, I was a tough guy, and he, he always let on that something like that was just not important in his life. And um, when my dad, before he died, he made me promise him certain things, and one of them had to do with Al Schwimmer. And so I found an opportunity to do something for Al Schwimmer, to help tell that story, and that came by way of a pardon for him. So I helped do that. And, um, and President Clinton uh, pardoned him. It's interesting because the only pardon you hear about in 2000 from President Clinton was Mark Rich. But on that list was Al Schwimmer, who was the hero. It was the righteous pardon. And you never heard a word. They did, of course, in Israel. And Al... I've never seen Al cry. I've never even seen him break. Um, but I'd arranged at some point afterwards for Al Schwimmer to meet President Clinton to thank him. And when he did that, Al Schwimmer actually had tears. So you knew how important it was to him. But he was such a proud man, he would never ask. But when he met the man who basically brought him full circle, and filled that little hole that was in his life uh, at, a, at an older age, um, he broke down. It was really, it was a wonderful moment. Can you tell me a little bit about Al? About his, uh, was he, did he stay in touch and close with your, your family? Oh, sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Al, when my dad got sick, 1989, Al Schwimmer, uh, was helping a young doctor, researcher in Israel, with a treatment for cancer. Al brought that fellow, David Rubin, over to Las Vegas with his treatment. It was brand new then. They didn't know how much and da 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 And they administered it to my dad. It was against the law. It was against everything at the time. Um, and I remember Al slept in my dad's bed with him that night, keeping an eye on him. And the next morning, after he'd had the first dose of that treatment, my dad got up feeling great, and he was not great. And we actually took him out to a restaurant for lemon meringue pie. And we said, oh my God, a miracle. Unfortunately, it was so early on that doctor, the doctor didn't know how much, how often, all that stuff. And so, you know, a month or two later, it, it stopped working, or it, it wasn't working. And he ultimately succumbed to it. But, um, no, Al, Al and my dad remained very close. In fact, 1977-ish, 76, 77, when Sadat went to Israel, my dad and Al teamed up again. They had teamed up uh, earlier too, but they teamed up again with a fellow by the name of Adnan Khashoggi. And their plan this time was to work on a peace plan for Israel, Saudi Arabia, Egypt, and any other Arab country that wanted to come along, which would have been most of them 
if they got this part done. So my dad needed Khashoggi because he was close to the Saudi king. He needed Schwimmer because he had all the tentacles into the Israeli government. And of course my dad needed my dad because that's what his responsibility was, was to make this happen. So he met with Sadat. They had this whole plan. And as Adnan Khashoggi explains it, when Sadat landed in Israel, for the first time ever, an Egyptian leader in Israel, the flag of Saudi Arabia was flying over the Dome of the Rock, over the mosque. And that was a tip-off to the Saudi king that Begin, Prime Minister Begin, had accepted the outline of the peace terms. And there was a line in Begin's speech welcoming Sadat that also was the tip-off that Khashoggi and Schwimmer had worked on to get into Begin's speech so that the Saudi king would know that, yes, they had a deal. And it, it revolved around Vaticanizing the holy city so that the holy uh, Muslim areas would be under the protector of the king of Saudi Arabia. And... Sure enough, when Sadat went there, Saudi Arabia, which normally would have been railing against it, was silent, as were some other countries. There was a guy named Saddam Hussein who didn't like what was going on, and he jumped in the middle of it, threatened a few of the Arab countries, and the thing fell apart. But it was a bold move, and um, it could have happened, but for, let's say, Saddam Hussein early on. But that was, uh, that was Al. And then, of course, uh, moving the Ethiopian Jews into Israel afterwards was a project between and amongst Al Schwimmer. That was his project. My dad, a guy named Nimrodi. I think it was Yaakov Nimrodi. Ariel Sharon. There's all this secret mission. They went to Kenya, to Adnan Khashoggi's ranch, where they met the president of Yemen, Numeri, before he was deposed. And Numeri was going to give Israel the right to land in Kenya as they left Ethiopia to fly to Israel. Ultimately, it happened, but it happened without Numeri, and it happened a year or two later. Um, but maybe they were just ahead of their time. How, I'm curious how your father continued to find himself involved in these uh, well, he, you know, I think I told you, is he would tell his kids, when you hear a noise go the other way, it was the exact opposite of everything he did. He had this incredible sense of he had to do the right thing all the time, which meant he had to go f toward the danger. And he lived on adrenaline. Um, I think it was Ralph Goldman. You know who Ralph Goldman is? Ralph was one of the volunteers way back in the day, and he described... My dad is a man who lived on adrenaline. I don't know if that summed it up, because I don't think so, but it certainly was part of it. My dad needed some action. Um, but he needed action for the right reasons. And so when you go back to that time he was in France, in Nancy, and he said to himself, if ever I'm going to have an opportunity to help, I'm going to do it. Fast forward to Al Schwimmer and Reynolds Selk which gave him an opportunity to do it. Fast forward to the entire history of, well, recent history of Israel where there were lots of opportunities to help. It was just a continuation of that commitment to do what he could, which probably started from the picture on his grandfather's house of Theodore Herzl and learning about Zionism. It's a pretty simple thread. It's simple when you put it like that. Yeah, <laughs> again, it's, it's a lot harder to right. keep no, the I piece of the thread, the thread together. People, I get it. There's a lot of people who, who had pictures of Herzl and a lot of people who had uh, opportunities, and not so many of them really rise to I'm, I'm I'm his son, so it's certainly not difficult for me, but I understand that I am biased, clearly biased. Uh, I was one of the most fortunate people in my generation to have been able to grow up in the home of a man like this. Uh, who, you know, part of the greatest generation and at the high end of the greatest generation in terms of people who did. They didn't talk, they did. And uh, 
those are rare individuals in any generation. He was just that guy. Uh, and whether it was doing it on behalf of Israel or jumping in the back seat of a taxi cab in Las Vegas trying to convince a guy with a shotgun not to kill himself. My dad just, you know, I guess he, he worried about the consequences after. You know, he never thought about him while he was acting. And your mother the whole time? Thought he was nuts. <laughs> but stuck with him through thick and thin. I mean, she, as I said, she said she fell in love with him the night she met him, the moment she met him, and never wavered her entire life. And to hang on and through and with a guy like this, it's like, it's like hanging on to a tornado your whole life. And she did it. So it took a very strong woman and a very devoted person to even decide she was going to hang. Most people would have said, see you later, Charlie. She didn't. Yeah, well, she saw the, she, I'm sure she saw the, besides loving him, she saw the ultimate goodness in him and knew that someone had to keep, kind of like my grandmother, someone had, while my grandfather prayed, my grandmother had to raise the family and make sure things worked. While my dad did all this stuff, my mother, who was very, very bright and very, very capable in her own right, had to make sure the family grew and but stayed there together. A lot, of, a lot of trust and faith. She didn't know what he was doing half the time. Right. Right. Well, I mean, I used to, I remember in, in the latter years, I'd take him out to the airport and stick him on a plane. He would never tell me where he was going. And I'm sure he didn't tell her where he was going other than, I've got to go. Where was he going? He was going off on his exploits. He took me once. He called me once. I was in Washington and said, do you want to go to Geneva? I'm going to go on the Concorde. It was the old, you know, the SST. I'm thinking, one, I've never been to Geneva, and two, I've never been on a supersonic airplane, so immediately it was a yes. I didn't say why, when, and the next day I had to meet him in New York. So I went up to New York, I got on the Concorde with him, and we flew to uh, England, then went over to Geneva. I remember we checked into some hotel, and it was the coolest thing I'd ever seen. There was a bag you could put your shoes in and put them outside on the door, and they would polish them. When I was in school, I don't think I'd ever polish my shoes. So I thought, this is cool, I'll have polished shoes. So I go to stick them on the door outside. And he says, what are you doing? I said, what do you mean, what am I doing? And it says right here, though, polish your shoes. You put it on the, don't you do that. Don't you know that's how people die? I said, what? He says, the Mossad, they need to get rid of somebody. They put a little drop in the heel of their shoe. Three days later, the people dropped dead of a heart attack, and no one knows what happened. You want to put your shoes out there? No. I said, never again. So I didn't. And now I don't put my shoes outside to get polished. But he knew that. And then when I went with him the next day, he said, you sit in the corner over there. And I sat in some corner at a table while my dad goes into this long, cavernous place next to a train station and meets with a guy at a table. And then he leaves, says, come on, we can go home now. It was obviously the Mossad, you know, he, he was doing stuff, and I don't know what it was. He didn't tell me what that one was. I was just worried, still worried about my shoes at that point. Uh, big difference between father and son. Um, he, he got around. All the while, he's the publisher of the paper. Of the paper. Yeah, yeah. And, and when Israel needed things during his time, he was, a, he was one of the go-to guys. There were a number of people, obviously. But he was very effective. Needed things like... Needed help in the United States. He practically raised our congressional delegation you know, in Nevada. They were all imbued with this desire to make sure Israel survived and protect Israel. I'm sure it was the right thing. In their own minds, it was the right thing to do, but it didn't hurt that Hank Greenspan was on their case every day. Republicans, Democrats? All of them. Didn't matter. He, he didn't. He, he was a Republican in the liberal uh, Eastern Republican tradition that those guys don't exist anymore. They've been chased. Um, so, but he, and he was pardoned by a Democrat. He ran for governor in Nevada as a Republican, got killed. Uh, so politics was not that meaningful to him. He loved politics, but which... Whether you were Republican or Democrat was not important. It's 
whether you did the right thing was important. So he supported both Republicans and Democrats. And he used those connections to help Israel throughout. Always. Always. He did tell me one story with Prime Minister Begin. It was around the time he was trying to convince Begin, and maybe others were too, but I know he was, uh, when Sadat was coming, that they had to do this, they had to make peace with the Arabs. And at some point, Begin stopped my dad in the room and he said, Hank, when are you going to stop yelling at me? And my dad said, I will stop yelling at you when you start listening to me. And it was trying to convince him that he had to make this deal with Saudi Arabia. Now this is 50 years ago now, 40 years ago now. And they're still trying to do that. They're getting closer. And it'll probably happen in the, the same kind of framework where Saudis will play an important part in any piece. He was always just a little bit early. But he was there. got to know them, your father talked about them, you know, Teddy Collick. Uh, yes, I got to know Teddy Collick very well, uh, went very well. I was always a little kid, even when I was an adult, I was a little kid to Teddy, but I used to go to Israel a lot and would always go visit with Teddy. Um, he had this place, Mishkanot, he had a re there was a restaurant there that overlooked the old city. That's where we would always go. And, you know, we would reminisce. I would, my dad was gone at that point, 1989, so it was between 89 and the time Teddy passed away. But um, there's a great, wonderful story. Um, Teddy was running for mayor for his sixth or seventh term, whatever it was, 1994. And Frank Sinatra and Barbara Sinatra were doing a fundraiser for him in Los Angeles. So we were naturally invited, my family, so we all went over to Los Angeles to help. And Teddy was there, I think he was in his 80s by then. And um, Sinatra got up to introduce him. And I didn't know this at the time, or until that time, but Sinatra and Teddy Colick went back to 1947 together. And Frank was having trouble. Well, I will. Frank was having trouble even getting the words out at that time. He had had dementia of some kind. And it, it was embarrassing to him because he couldn't even get the words out. So Teddy lumbers up. He says, go sit down. Let me do this. And he says to all these people, all of them were friends. We'd known him for a long time. He said, you all know why we're here. And we'll get to that in a minute. He says, but I want to tell you a story about that boy over there, Sinatra, that boy. And he told a story that he since wrote about in his book, but at that time he had never told that story before. That when Teddy was sent to the United States by Ben Gurion to run this operation, to get weapons, raise money, he stayed at the Hotel 14 in New York the basement of which was the Copacabana Club. And Teddy couldn't go out. The feds were always on his case. So when he wanted any kind of social activity, he would go downstairs at night into the Copacabana Club. He'd have a drink at the bar, and he'd listen to the music. And he was especially enamored with this skinny young Italian singer named Frank Sinatra. This is 1947. One thing led to another. I mean, night after night after night, Sinatra would see him sitting at the bar. Eventually, like, hello, come have a drink with me. You're one of my biggest fans, whatever that was. And Teddy said that led to every time Sinatra was playing, Teddy would go down, they would sit at a table till the wee hours, have a drink or two together and talk. And never once did Frank Sinatra ask Teddy Colick, what are you doing here? Nor did Teddy ever volunteer it because he was breaking the law. And there came a time, Teddy's telling the story, there came a time when he had a bribe, cash, for an Irish sea captain, had a ship in New York Harbor. They'd covered 
all these munitions with sugar, bags of sugar. They were going to take it out past the 12 mile limit, offload it onto another ship, and have it sail to Israel. But he couldn't figure out how to get the money, the bribe money, to the captain. And so he goes downstairs as he usually did. Sinatra comes over as he always did. They were having a drink together, and Sinatra looked at him. And he said, Teddy, what's wrong? You're different today. And Teddy's telling us, he said, I don't know what came over me, but for the first time since I was in New York, I told another human being what I was doing. That human being was Frank Sinatra. And I told him my dilemma. If I took the money to the captain, the feds would follow me. Not only would they confiscate the money, but I was worried that they'd wait and confiscate the weapons, which I couldn't allow. And I didn't know how to get this done. And we talked all night. He says, that morning at 6 o'clock, I left the front door of the Hotel 14 with my satchel. And the feds followed me. Out the back door through the kitchen went Frank Sinatra with a paper bag full of cash. And he took that money to that ship, ship's captain and paid him the bribe. And that ship sailed and got those weapons to Israel. That's who Frank Sinatra is. This is Teddy telling us, that's who that boy is. And of course, first time anyone had ever heard that story. It was not a surprise, because anyone who knew Frank Sinatra and knew much about him knew that he was a sucker for the underdog. He was always a helping the little guy against the big guy. And so this is a classic David and Goliath story that he latched onto. But he did something. I mean, so if, if people are giving out accolades for those who were at the beginning and who really, really helped. Sinatra deserves one of those, for sure. And um, later on, a month or two later, Al Schwimmer called me and said, I need some help. What is it? President Clinton was president at the time, and I was friendly with the president. He said, the most popular man in Israel is Bill Clinton. Teddy's in the race of his life. I need Teddy to be able to meet Bill Clinton, take a couple of pictures, and we'll use the pictures in Israel. So not long before that, my wife and I were having dinner at the White House with the President, Mrs. Clinton, and two other guests, Norman and Lynn Lear. And after dinner, Hillary said, okay, I want to go around the table, and each one, I want you to tell us who on the world stage who you don't know who you'd like to meet and why. And frankly, as I sit here, I don't remember who Lynn said and who Norman said. I have no idea who I said or my wife. But I know that Bill Clinton, President Clinton, said he wanted to meet Nelson Mandela. And Hillary Clinton wanted to meet Teddy Collick. Why Teddy Collick? Because he had been mayor of Jerusalem for all those years, and he had managed to have Jews and Arabs living together in relative peace. And she wanted to ask him how he did it. And he was such a remarkable man, and she so respected him, she wanted to meet him. So a month or two later, when Al Schwimmer calls and says, I need to get Teddy to meet with the president, I called. And I said, I have a way for Hillary to meet Teddy Collick. When? Well, Hillary's not going to be here, but bring him over. I would like to see him, the president. So I took him over, had the ambassador from Israel there. Al was there. We all go in, and I had Teddy tell the president the Frank Sinatra story because I knew that Clinton would love it, which he did. And they took pictures. And of course, we all know what happened. He didn't win the election, but... I tried. You know, it seemed like a good idea at the time. But um, Teddy Collick was a special, special, special man. And, you know, we have the uh, Hank Greenspun uh, uh, Plaza at the Jerusalem Botanical Gardens because Teddy insisted that he do something for his friend Hank. And Teddy was in charge of all that stuff. So that yeah, he insisted that he do something and we got to pay for it. That's how that works. Um, I got that part. 
Uh, and that's why that you know, botanical garden, the entrance is there. Um, and it's a permanent place for my dad, and, and it's a right place. Things grow from there. Forgot the question, but that's the answer. I was asked about Teddy Collins. Yeah. What about um, uh, Eliyahu Sakharov? Didn't know him. Didn't know him. Didn't know him. No. Wish I had. Uh, we did. He, he, he just passed away a few months yeah. ago. We did a, a 10 part, 26 hour interview with him. Wow. Yeah. Wow. They didn't always see the eye to eye. I think their styles were, were pretty different. But, uh, yeah. But Shimon, Shimon Perez? Well, yeah, oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, of course, Shimon was Al Schwimmer's running buddy, so to speak, or vice versa. I first met Shimon when I was 16. I was on an Israel tour for teenagers seven weeks or eight weeks in Israel. I was there with a bunch of teenagers from, Los, I mean from uh, the United States. And one night, there was a knock on the door, and whoever was leading our group comes in and says, there's someone here to see you. You need to get dressed because he's taking you to Tel Aviv or something. I didn't know who it was. He said, your father sent him. So I figured, okay, that's okay. So I go out. And there's this fellow by the name of Shimon Peres. He is working in the defense ministry for um, Golda Meir. And he's a friend of my father since 1947. And my father told him that, he was, that I was in Israel and he should come meet me and spend some time with me. So that's why he's here. I said, great. So, you know, I'd gotten dressed. Nice to meet you, sir. Where are we going? We get in his car and we drive to the Mann Auditorium in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv? Yeah. What's at the Mann Auditorium in Tel Aviv? Something that's very important to Shimon Peres, the Russian Philharmonic Orchestra. And he wants me to enjoy it. Well, you know, I wouldn't give you 10 cents for any Philharmonic Orchestra in those days, but the Russian Philharmonic Orchestra. I thought I was being a disloyal American. We were in the middle of the Cold War. You don't do anything with the Soviet Union. Why? Or maybe it was a Moscow Philharmonic. I, I didn't want to be seen in it, but I went anyway and didn't really appreciate it. But I watched Shimon Peres appreciate it. Of course, years later, I realized what he had done and why it was so important and on and on and on. But for a 16-year-old kid, it's just... It was not in my wheelhouse, and I was nervous because I thought I was being very unpatriotic. But that was the first time I met him. Of course, every time I went to Israel, I would go visit with Shimon. Um, the last time I saw him was at the time of the Jerusalem Film Festival. So it would have been about 2012. He was president of Israel then. And I had flown over there to show a documentary that we had done on my dad at the film festival. I was supposed to go for one showing and then a question and answer, but I wound up doing it two or three times because the lines were so long and the questions were so long, I, had to, I did that. And before I left, like 20 hours later, I had called Shimon, he said, come over. I went over to have tea with him, and we visited for about an hour. It was right after the Arab Spring, so whenever that date was. And I said, you know, when I go home, I have to write a column. So I need to write about the Arab Spring. And he was very profound and because I wrote about it. He said, you know, in springtime, if you go out in the spring without an umbrella, you will be woefully unprepared for the rain. I said, that sounds great. What does that mean? I always have to ask him what it means because, you know, that's how we thought. He said, they're not going to get this right for a few times. He says, there are going to be many changes in Egypt before they get it right. He said, they want an Arab Spring, but they're not prepared. 
And the one thing they have to do before they ever get any kind of democracy is they have to free 50% of their country. So what are you talking about? He said, the women. You must free the women or you'll never have a democracy. And I looked around the world and I, in my head, and he's absolutely right. And I came back and I wrote about that part of it. And the other part was that they will, they will have fits and starts if they continue if they get down that road before they get to a democracy. And sure enough, over the next two or three years, they had fits and starts and they have yet to get to a democracy because the women still are not free. Shimon was brilliant, absolutely brilliant. And uh, I'm sorry, you know, everybody passes away. I, I was fortunate enough to go to his funeral and um, he was a remarkable man. I'm just, I'm one of those lucky guys who got to know him. I'll, I'll do it. Yeah, sorry. No, that's all right. I'll just be cognizant of not moving. Thank you. Stanley Epstein? Buddy? I didn't know Stanley Epstein. I only knew him from the daily or from the film that uh, uh, Scott Goldstein, the director of the film, was making. He said, you got to listen to this. He brought it back because... He passed away shortly afterwards. Um, I didn't know the people my dad worked with, but, but Buddy Epstein, what was the story? he was one of the volunteers. He was one of the guys loading the ship in the, uh, uh, the, the boat that, with the portholes beneath, beneath the water. He's one of the countless number of people who were volunteers who my dad led, basically. And, uh, but he was close with my dad, apparently, because... You know, he knew every time he went to New York to see Teddy Colick. He, he knew about the time when Teddy said, you've got to uh, stop the longshoremen from dropping the crates full of weapons on the, on the docks in New York because he's exposing the weapons. Um, he knew that my dad called friends of his in the Purple Gang to, to get that stopped. You know, he knew about a lot of things. And I, don't, I didn't have the pleasure of meeting him because it... By the time we got the film done, he passed away not long after that. Um, but no, he, he was one of those you know, remarkable people who, who jumped up when the time came to jump up. That's, that's what's been so amazing. The, the experience for me recently, starting to hear these stories, okay, your, your dad was, was pretty well known as these things go. Not in the larger sense, I think Israelis don't really know certainly today's uh, generation, but you, you start to realize how many people were involved and who the people were that were kind of uh, leading them, and, and you think how it couldn't have been done without them, and it's just amazing, like, you know, so your father wasn't working alone, he had all these people that he was, uh, you know, helped somebody, he had uh, helped him with this thing, and he was uh, directing somebody else on, on, on some other piece of it. It's amazing. It is, but it's that's that story is told over and over and over again in all different circumstances. It's oh, peop, certainly those people did not do it for the glory, you know. They did it because they knew it was the right thing to do, and they were the, you know you look around and if I don't do it, no one's going to do it, and so it was. For the most part, it was a split second decision. They knew it was the right thing to do, and they did it. Um, you know, you talk about people in Israel not knowing who they were. They don't know who they were, but they, they want to still respect and give some reverence to what they did uh, because they wouldn't be there without them, and they know that. Um, but I know people used to, in this country, used to follow my dad, I, I don't know how, his exploits. He was, not, he was not not well known in the United States because he did have this pulpit, this newspaper, and he was not quiet about it. You know, when you go after Senator McCarthy and McCarran and all these guys, uh, people quietly cheer you on. And, um, you know, that's what he did his whole life. But the Buddy Epsteins of the world, you're right. It couldn't have happened without people like that. Wouldn't have happened. And, um, but they didn't do it for the glory. They did it for the right reasons. Uh, were there... 
were there other people from the Las Vegas community that were involved? I never heard that. I never, I just didn't know. I know, I know that the mob, mobsters, if you will, uh, from the 40s and so, did a certain part in helping, clearly helping. I don't know if they were the ones who came here or if they were cousins or colleagues or peer group or whatever. Uh, I, n I never heard of other, my dad never said, you know, that guy helped. The only time he ever hinted at anyone who helped was a time he didn't, who, when he didn't tell me that the guy helped, but he, it was Jimmy Hoffa. And uh, Jimmy Hoffa helped a lot. Uh, he was there in a major way. But my dad never said he helped at the beginning with Israel. He just told me once that this man has done more for Israel than I can ever tell you. And my, dad, my dad never talked like that. The things that he would never tell me, he would never tell me. And, uh, and yet I knew a lot of things that Jimmy Hoffa did for Israel. He was a huge stalwart supporter of Israel. Never would have amounted to the things that my dad couldn't tell me. I pieced it together years later, and I'm certain that I know what he did. Um, but my dad never told me. But no, no one in Las Vegas. I mean, Hoffa was part of Las Vegas. He helped grow it. So to that extent, uh, yeah, there was one guy. smaller sense, you know, like bearing the brunt of a uh, father who was always, uh, you know, up to something, and also like in the larger sense, uh, how it impacted your, the way that you view Israel, the way that you view uh, the call to action, things like that. Wow. Well, in the smaller sense, I would say once, once we understood what he and others did, you can't help but be very prideful of, of what they did and proud of them and have some of that just kind of wash over you, saying, I'm, I'm really part of something that was much bigger. Um, but in a larger sense, now that you may, the way you ask that question, I'm... My family has always been hugely supportive of Israel, hugely supportive of almost anything Jewish in that regard. Um, and I'm thinking my dad's story and his actions are not dissimilar in our lives to that picture of Theodore Herzl in my grandfather's house. There was a continuum. You could show me a picture of Theodore Herzl, now I know what he looked like. But for the most part, we wouldn't know who he was. But we know who my dad was. And my dad was who he was in part because of how he grew up. So somehow that got to us. It's certainly not in the DNA, but it is in the DNA. And, uh, and knowing his story and knowing what all these people did, it would be shameful not to do our part to continue that legacy. Um, I mean, I hope we never have to do the things that he had to do, because I'm pretty sure most of us would be found wanting. But to be doing something, anything, it, I track it back to that. Sure, that's the larger sense. And that, unfortunately, I think, is what we're starting to miss, certainly in the United States as we get two and three generations out. The story goes away. The compelling reasons go away. It's too easy to listen to another narrative that is either opposite or very different and get misguided along the way. And therefore we forget 
You know the old story, you should never forget where you came from? It's too easy to forget where we came from today. That's why I think it's important that what you're doing. You've got to, you've got to get these stories down because they're, for the most part, they're ordinary people doing extraordinary things for the right reasons. And that's going to go on through history, whether it's Israel or whatever comes next. Um, people have to know that they've got it within themselves to do it when faced with those, I was going to say opportunities, those challenges. Um, so it's important what you're doing. One of the things that, that's fascinated me throughout this whole project has been the idea of uh, choices that people made when they were faced with those challenges slash opportunities. You know, you're, you're at a crossroads. There is something out there. Do you answer the call? Do you rise to the occasion? And, and why? Who are the people who do that? And, and what motivates them? And uh, it's really fascinating to hear, you know, you talk about your father, about some of these pieces that kind of went into it, that, uh, that made him into one of those heroes. You know, I'm reminded of a, a comment my dad made to me once. I was in law school, I think, college or law school. And we were walking down the street in Washington, D.C., and I forgot what we were talking about. But he said, the one thing that concerns me about your generation, now I'm a baby boomer, so I was one generation removed from the Holocaust. The one thing that, remind, that concerns me about your generation is that unlike my generation, he said, where I grew up in the middle of a worldwide depression and we had to learn who we were and what we could do to survive. And then we grew up, then we were hit with a world war and we had to reach down deep, all of us, to defend our country and defeat Hitler. We learned then what we could do and who we were. He says, as a parent, I don't wish any of those things on my children or my grandchildren, but I worry that you won't have these stealing moments in your lives when you've truly learned what you can do when faced with that opportunity or that challenge. He said, that's what I worry about. And of course, Vietnam, we were in the middle of Vietnam, and the country was a mess. We, had, we weren't doing too well as a generation on how we were dealing with that one. And I thought about this in 2008 and 9 when the, crash, the economic crash came, not dissimilar than what happened in 1929. And I thought of that as, is this one of those really, those stealing moments when I have to find out who I am or do we have to find out who we are? And, and it motivated me to get through it. I mean, it was tough out here. It motivated me that this, this must be one of those moments. Who am I? What am I going to do? Am I going to run or am I going to get in the middle of it? And uh, maybe it's not quite the same as 1929, but it sure felt like it was. And now I don't want a war to come, so we get the second one. I, I don't want to do that. But I've always remembered that, that he was worried about this generation. And as we look back, we've got two or three generations since then now. As I look back at the baby boom generation, and I wonder just how well have we acquitted ourselves when compared to what the greatest generation withstood and stood up to. We haven't been a huge success, in my view. Not, not on an individual, I'm talking about as, as a generation. Um, I have a lot of hope for my grandchildren's generation. They're going to do it. Um, this has been really fascinating. Is there anything, any stories, anything that you uh, think that I missed or something you want to Mention family, anything that, uh... Well, there is a story. I mean, you, you brought up Buddy Epstein, and I made me think of Hoffa. There's a story you probably should have down for posterity. Um, 
Uh, so I'll tell it very quickly. A few years ago, the Yitzhak Rabin Center that has a fundraiser every year or so in Washington, D.C., they called me and said, uh, we're honoring Jimmy Hoffa, who was then, still is the president of the Teamsters, and his father posthumously for all they did for, all they have done and all they did for Israel. And at the same time, we want to honor your father posthumously. Will you come back to Washington and receive the award? Of course, I'll be honored to do it. I'll fast forward real quickly through, through the events, but I show up that night with my wife, Myra. And um, I go in to look at the room where we're going to, where they're going to do this. And I look at the tables. Now, in most Jewish fundraising events, you can tell who's sponsoring and who's coming. I look at the tables, and it's Teamsters Local 12, Teamsters Local 35, te whatever they were. Every table was, I mean, Jimmy Hoffa had made sure that the thing was a huge success because they had all these Teamsters. Not a typical Jewish fundraising event. So I start thinking, what am I going to say? I was going to just say thank you because it wasn't my night. It was Jimmy Hoffa's night. And then I immediately, I had just finished reading a book about the Purple Gang in Detroit and Jimmy Hoffa's fight for ascendancy to the union lead against the Purple Gang. That, that was the clash, and Hoffa won. And then shortly thereafter, made up with the Purple Gang, and they went forward together in a lot of things they did. And that was in my head. And the other thing that was in my head was Buddy Epstein's story in that documentary about how when Teddy Collick told my father that the longshoremen were breaking the crates open and jeopardizing the entire operation and someone had to stop it. And then I thought, while I'm standing here looking at the room, of those words my father told me when I was standing at the base bottom floor of the Teamsters, International Brotherhood of Teamsters building in Washington. And my dad said to me, I'm now going to introduce you to a man who's done more for Israel than I can ever tell you. And as I said earlier, he never talked like that. And I went upstairs with my dad and I met Jimmy Hoffa, the father. And I knew my dad had gone to Israel with him and Hoffa opened up orphanages and did a lot of things and Teamsters bought billions of dollars of Israel bonds. But those, those are not acts that my father could never tell me about. There was something that Jimmy Hoffa did that my dad could never tell me. Now, I had heard the stories, as I'm sure you have, that there were Teamsters running contraband up and down the East Coast in their trucks to help the effort. But everyone knew about that, or people knew about it. That wasn't it. So when I got up there to say thank you for this award, I looked at Jimmy, the son, and I said, I'm going to tell a story on your father. I said, I can't tell you it's 100% true, but I can tell you I believe it's 1,000% true. And I went on and I explained the Buddy Epstein piece and on and on and on, and then my dad's words. I said, and I now know what happened. Because when Teddy Collick said to my father, you've got to stop the team, the, lo the longshoremen from dropping those crates. And Buddy Epstein said, Hank went to his contacts with the Purple Gang. I put it together, Purple Gang and Jimmy Hoffa. And I said, and there was only one man in America leading one group in America that was tough enough to tell the longshoremen not to drop those crates. And that was the Teamsters. That's what your father did for Israel that my dad could never tell me about. He saved the state of Israel. Of course, the place went crazy. I mean, <laughs> Teamsters were... There's no doubt in my mind that's exactly what happened. That's the way it went down. Because I know my dad called these brothers who had gaming casinos in Nevada and said, I need your help. And they called Jimmy Hoffa. That's how it worked. That's it. To me, that's Jimmy Hoffa, Frank Sinatra, from places you don't expect it. That's why Israel's here. <coughs> One reason. That's a good story. Yeah. There's no doubt in my mind it's true.
So that's all I know. <coughs> well, thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you for doing this. Um, can I ask a, a favor? Sure. Would, would you mind taking that off? If either even on your primary pin or something, just a still, maybe just like a, oh, sure. Just want to, you know, take a picture or something so that I can, like of the setup or the, oh, all right, I was trying to get a bunch of those. Oh, you did? Let me know if either works for you or not. Thank you, both of you.